Job chapter 13 and verse 1. Of course, Job, of course, had been through his trials and tribulations, and now his friends are there to give him advice. And this is what Job has to say about that. Lo, mine eye hath seen all this, mine ear hath heard and understood it. What ye know, the same do I know also. I am not in fear unto you. Surely I would speak to the Almighty and desire to reason with God. But ye are forgers of lies, ye are all physicians of no value. Oh, that with you would altogether hold you peace, and it should be your wisdom. Hear now my reasoning, and hearken unto the pleadings of my lips. Will you speak wickedly for God, and talk deceitfully for Him? Of course, the title of the message this morning is, is Physicians of No Value. Physicians of No Value. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the Word of God, and Father, the privilege we have to read and hold it in our hands, and have the truth without error. Father, we ask you will bless your message this morning. You will guide and direct our thoughts and our hearts. And Lord, we ask that you'll have your will and way in this service. And Father, that your spirit might work without any kind of hindrance. And bless now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, after the last nine months, that's something I found out, and probably you found out at some time or another, that a lot of times doctors and physicians are of little value. Uh, most of the time you go to them and you go away more confused than you, you were when you went. And if you weren't feeling bad when you went, you're surely feeling bad when you left because if nothing else, they're going to knock a hole in your pocketbook when you walk out the door. But most of the time, and a lot of times, physicians are of little value. And we even find that that Jesus said that. Remember when Jesus had the man bring his uh, son, the guy brought his son to him and uh, they told him in Matthew chapter 17 and he said that the doctors couldn't cure him. Well, the thing we need to understand that we as Christians are physicians for a sin-sick world. Our world is sick. We all have a disease that we were inbred with and born with and will be with until Jesus takes us out of this old flesh. The Bible says that we've all gone astray. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. We're just a bunch of sinners. That's all we are. We all have that disease, and we're going to have that disease. It's an incurable disease until Jesus takes us out of this old body. Now, if you could live out of this body, then you could cure the disease. You wouldn't have to worry about it. But the Bible says the sin's in the flesh. And I don't care what Jimmy Swaggart says. He can't live out of his flesh, and you can't either. So we have to deal with it. And the reason a lot of times physicians are of little value is because they really don't know what the problem is. They say they're practicing medicine. That's the truth. They're practicing, hoping they get it right. You know, and they send you through all of these tests and they send you through all the x-rays and scans and blood work and all that. And then some, most of the time they're still just guessing what's wrong with you. And they give you, a lot of times, they give you more medication that has more side effects and problems than what you had to start with. Uh, but the great thing is, those of us who are Christians and we're physicians or doctors to cure this old sin-sick world, we know exactly what's wrong with this world. Brother Jim sang about it. What we need and what this world needs is not more money. The world's richer than it's ever been, but it's worse than it's ever been. We don't need more education. That's what they'll tell you. We need, we need to be more educated in our world. Our world is more educated now than it's ever been, but yet it's worse. And you go down the list of all the things that society and the world and uh, philosophers want to say that we need to fix this world is not what the problem is. The problem with this old world is it's a lost and dying world and going to hell without Jesus Christ. And the whole cure is, and we must recognize, the whole cure for this whole thing is, is Jesus. People need the Lord, as the old song says. That's, that's what the problem is. And until we really realize what the problem is, and we look and see, and we, we don't have to go far to see the problem. We can look out in our world, and people pass us by every day, and we can see it in their eyes, empty people, 
filled with despair and heartache and troubles and problems, headed to who knows where. The greatest need that people have today is the need for the Lord. Uh, we can fix the flesh and all kinds of things, but we can't fix the spirit. And un this medical science now is really figuring out that you can't heal the body very good without healing the spirit with it. They're tied together. They're not, they're, you can't separate the two. Uh, how many people have you known that, that their spouse passed away and they just grieved themselves to death no matter what the doctors did? Because you, the doctor may could heal what was wrong with the flesh, but he couldn't heal that spirit. The same thing with the world today. We could, we could get rid of every piece of alcohol in the world and every tobacco and drug and anything else. We could, we could get rid of all of that, but we've still not healed the spirit because the spirit's the problem. Can we see it? Yes, we can see it. We recognize the need. Look at our world. Man, you don't have to listen to the news five minutes to see that that's where the world is. Well, then if we recognize the need, the question is, is what are we doing about it? You see, a lot of times the problem is that we recognize the need, but we're not willing to do anything about it. Uh, if we recognize the need, we're taking the attitude of Job's friends. Job's friends, number one, didn't know what the problem really was. They didn't realize that God was using Job to show other people the power of God. They said, Job, you must have really done something terrible for God to be doing this to you. And sometimes we want to look around and think that, well, you know, whatever the problem is and the reason is, is because of something they've done. Well, we don't know that for sure. We have to understand that if we don't turn and find out what the need is and then address the need and do something about it, we've not helped much. Uh, you know, the book of James talks about when we see a person in need, if we don't help them and we don't say, well, God bless you, be full, that doesn't do a thing in the world for their pain in their belly, grumbling and growling. Well, the same thing, we see our world going to basically to hell in a handbasket, getting worse by the day, wickeder by the day. But what are we doing about it? It's up to us. You understand, the lost world cannot fix itself. The Bible says that people who are lost are like dead people. Now, I've done a lot of funerals. And I, up to this point, I've never seen a dead person in one of those funerals do anything. But if they ever do, let me tell you, they're going to be having a new door somewhere because I'm getting out of there. <laughs> dead people don't do things. Only living people the Bible says we're made alive by the blood of Christ. We're the living ones. We're the ones that can make the change and make a difference in this old world. So it's up to us. We're the physicians for this old lost and dying world. We must have a clear understanding of our duty. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. We look and if I, we wanted to take and draw from somebody, we, we, our world is always looking for people to draw from as heroes and to pattern their life after. We as Christians have a hero that we ought to pattern our life after, and that's Jesus Christ. And one of the things you saw of Jesus many times was how he looked over the lost world out around him, and it says, and he had compassion on them. Even as far as when he went to the cross, after they had beat him and scourged him and plucked out his beard and put him through the monkey trials and did all the things that he went through that we don't even have the mind or the ability to really fathom or understand how bad it was. The Bible says that he was not even recognizable as a man. He was like a beat up piece of meat when he was put on the cross. After all of that, Jesus looked out and what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you know, that's the way we have to be. We have to be like Jesus. If we're going to have an effect on this world, we have to have the right attitude. Do I have to love their sin? No, I don't. Do I have to like their sin? No, I don't. But I have to love the person in spite of what they do. I have to look past that outward facade. I have to look past that outward demeanor. I have to look past the outward things they do 
and realize no matter how bad they are or what they are, there's a soul inside that flesh. And without somebody telling that person how to get saved, that person's going to die and go to hell. It's up to us. Jesus always did something when he saw a need. Nobody ever comes to Jesus that he won't meet your need if you'll let him. You say, well, I know people who's coming. It doesn't seem like Jesus met their need. Well, then he, they wouldn't let him. They wouldn't let him. You see, what Jesus is able to do with you is dependent on you what you'll allow him to do. A lot of times what Jesus wants to do is not what we want to do. Kind of like my doctor. When he said, you're going to have to have this need done again. That wasn't what I wanted to hear. That certainly wasn't what I wanted to do. But it's got to be done. And sometimes the Lord comes and asks us to do things that we really don't want to do. Sometimes it really seems foolish. I've told you many times when God really laid on my heart to call me to preach, I thought God was out of his mind. I said, man, you got to be, something wrong, God. You, you were looking at the wrong person, not me. You, so what's wrong with this? Uh, I was the most shy, introverted person in the world. I said, God, you got to be nuts. But God knew what he was doing. And I've said this many times, the things you need to remember about God, God will never come to you ever and say, can you do whatever? Because you know what your answer is going to be? Go back through the Old Testament. What, he, what did Moses say when he came to Moses? Oh, no, God, I can't do that. I can't speak right. And just go through the list. God will never come and say, can you do anything? Because your answer is going to be no. That's our stock answer as mankind is no. But Jesus always comes and says, will you? Because that was my thing. I said, God, I can't speak in front of people. I can't even stand the people to look at me and do anything. But God changed that. God said, will you? And if you'll be willing to do what God wants you to do, he will give you the ability. The Bible says about witnessing. He said, don't worry about what you're going to say. If you'll go witness, God will give you the things to say. God will give you that ability to talk to people. No matter what your personality is. I wished I was one of them people that had the gift of gab. I'm not one of them people. In fact, I'm one of them people who don't like to talk unless I absolutely have to. You know. I wished I had that. But God will take you and use you if you'll let it happen. The problem we have in our world today and the reason that we have so many physicians of no value, a lot of people are indifferent. Our world has took the attitude, well, it's all about me and I'm not going to worry about anybody else. Well, that sounds good, I guess. But what if nobody had ever cared for you? What if nobody had ever witnessed to you? What if nobody had ever invited you to church? What if no, anybody had never showed you the word of God or how to be saved? Where would you be? Where would you be going? Yes, the world can take care of itself, but it can't take care of itself right. It's up to us. We are called to do that. Colossians chapter 4 verse 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. You see, we have to be busy doing what God would have us do as a Christian because we don't have much time. I believe that any minute, at any time, the trump could sound and we could be called out of this old world. Or if not, death could knock on our door at any time. The only time... The Bible talks about all the time when we leave this life, we enter into what? God's rest. If we're going to work for God and we're going to do something for God, our only time to do that is right now. And he said, redeem the time. And I, I'm as bad as anybody about putting stuff off. I'm going to do that tomorrow. Sooner or later, there's no more tomorrows. Sooner or later, there's no more tomorrows. Of course, the old saying is tomorrow never comes. But we have the hope of tomorrow. We're all hoping tomorrow the sun will come up and we have to go to work or we have plans or whatever it is we're going to do. But the Bible says we have no guarantee of tomorrow. 
We have no guarantee of another heartbeat. All we have is right now. So we need to be busy redeeming uh, the time. Our walk is to be forward to those that were without Christ. The Bible tells us go into all the world and all the great commissions is always go. Busy redeeming the time. Jude tells us that we have compassion making a difference. And verse 23 says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You see, the great thing is we literally, when we show somebody how to be saved, we literally pluck them out of the fires of hell and put them on the road to heaven. Here's the problem. Why do we not see the great revivals like we've saw in the past and years past? Why do we not see people even in our services getting saved today like we used to? Here's the key in the last part of verse 23. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. We're not upset over sin anymore. Our world through media and whatever means it is, it's got us comfortable with sin. Back in the 30s, remember when Gone with a Come, a wind came out. First movie that ever had the word damn in it. Everybody had a wall-eyed, hissy, conemption fit. I'd be happy if that's all they said. Look what we're accustomed. I'm about ready to just turn my TV plumb off. It's even crept over into cartoons and stuff now. You can't hardly find anything that doesn't have cussing in it. What for? I was told in the, one of the things that helped me with that problem, and when and I was always a preacher, I had a little bit of a problem with that one time, using foul language. One of the guys told me, and that's kind of what helped me get on track, so I'll help you to get on track if you have a problem with it. He told me, he said, you realize that when you cuss, that just tells me you're too stupid to know anything else to say. Amen. I went, okay. <laughs> but my whole point, where was I? Oh, my whole point was... We're just not upset with sin like we used to be. And we've got so accustomed to it and so comfortable with it that it has to be really something off the wall and something really terrible before we get upset over it. My Bible says I ought to be upset because people lie. We're in the time of we're getting ready to have elections. The biggest liars in the world are politicians. We ought to be upset. Sin tears and destroys everything we know. It ought to upset us because of the sin in our world. And that's why we can't make the difference we used to. Does that mean I shouldn't try? No. We have to be a people of vision. Proverbs 29 and 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there's no vision. We have to... Yes, this world is wicked than it's ever been. And yes, it's harder to win somebody than it's ever been. The devil has taught people what we want them to say, and they'll say what we want them to say to leave, make, make us leave them alone. But we still have to go out and win people and touch people and reach people because we're the only one God's given the job to do. The stars are not going to do it. The clouds are not going to do it. The animals are not going to do it. Though all of those things that God created cries out there is a God unless people realize there is a God and makes them accountable and guilty before God but they have to have knowledge of the word of God and that's our job to take it to them one of the great things that I hope comes in my life that I can say what Paul said is his life was coming to an end he said I fought a good fight I finished my course I've kept the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. Think with me this morning. If your life was to end today, could you say that? You say, you know, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've done everything I could to win those around me. I've done everything I could to live a life that would show Christ to others. I've lived a life that would be pleasing to God. I've kept the faith. Now that doesn't mean by any stretch of the imagination that your faith might not get weak and you might have problems. But you still have that faith in Christ that you've always had. 
If we're going to be of value to those who are hurting in this world, we must be committed to finishing the course. I believe that's the second problem we have in our Christian world today. We have too many quitters. We have too many quitters. God doesn't want quitters. He wants used to beers. What's a used to beer? Well, I used to be a Sunday school teacher, but now I'm driving the bus. I used to do this, but now I'm doing that for the Lord. He doesn't mind used to beers. As long as you go from doing something to something else, he doesn't care. That's fine. But it's when people just give up and quit. What a sad thing when we give up on the world we live in. My Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We have no reason to give up. We're on the winning side. People in this world depend on us. They're depending on us whether they realize it or not. You say, preacher, I just don't think that's so. Anytime any catastrophe has happened in this world or in America, what happened when 9-11 happened? Oh, everybody wanted the preachers and the, everybody to pray and everything. They turned, they turned to us. Why? Because they know we have, we're on the winning side. They know that we serve the God who has the power to fix anything and everything in this world. Though they want to ignore it. People who've never been in church in their life, let them get in the hospital or one of their loved ones get in the hospital. Who's the first person they call? Oh, preacher, will you come up here and pray for my loved one or win my loved one to the Lord? Why? Because they know we serve a God who's able to do anything and everything. Though they may not admit it, they know it. And they look to us. This morning, if people are looking to you, are you prepared the Bible says we're always to be ready to give an answer to that blessed hope that's in us. Are you ready this morning to do that? Here's the point where I tie this all together. If you can't or you won't, you're like the friends of Job. You do the world no good. You're of no value. I hate it when I go to the doctor and I tell him, okay, here's what's wrong. And he say, well, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong. How does that make you feel? Makes me want to punch him right in the snoot. And I'm not a violent person. I don't know. I don't know. You're the doctor. You're supposed to know. Never ceases to amaze me. Christian people who don't know how to lead someone to the Lord. That's something you ought to know. You ought to know. Because if they come to you and ask you, well, let's go find the preacher. Or let, you may not. You know, one of my sticklers, and I'm winding up closing with this. One of my sticklers is invitation. Because you understand, without the Holy Spirit dealing with a person, they can't get saved. When they come and say, you know, I think I need to be saved. Can you show me how to be saved? And you say, well, I need to go find somebody else, or I need to get somebody else, or let's go do this. You understand between that time frame, the Holy Spirit can quit dealing and you're out of, you, they're, they're lost. That's why I'm a stickler about invitation. I don't care how the Word of God goes out here, we have invitation. And we have it right then. One of the things I had with the youth camp we went to that time is they had no formal invitation for three to four services. What good did it do them to preach? What good did it do them to give out the Word of God? They gave no opportunity to respond to it. When the word of God goes out and someone comes to you, you need to be ready to give an answer. Because you got to give the answer when the Holy Spirit's working, not later. How about it this morning? Are you a physician of value? You understand the world is looking to you for answers and cures for their sin problem. We have the cure. The cure for their sin problem is Jesus Christ. He said he'll wash away your sins as white as snow. Just as if you'd never sinned. Will that get rid of it in the flesh? No. Like I said, the sin's in the flesh and you can't live out of it. You're going to still deal with it. But the spiritual man is cured immediately forever of sin. Past, present, and future. We have the cure. Are you willing to give it? Let's bow our heads in prayer.